Good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm looking at upper tract urethelial carcinoma, and I really wanted to focus away from the nephrourethectomy. We all know that's the gold standard, but there's so much else going on in the field. So I'm just going to give a brief introduction, talk about different diagnostic modalities, nephron sparing techniques, um, upper tract chemotherapy, talk about the gold standard, then look at lymph nodes and uh, different types of chemotherapy and risk stratification for the chemotherapy. So uh, upper tract urethelial carcinoma, it's about 5 to 10 percent of urethelial carcinoma. Um, it recurs in the contralateral kidney about 2 to 6 percent of the time. And classic carcinogens do apply, you know, the ones that we know from the bladder, so tobacco, aromatic hydrocarbons from work, um, cyclophosphamide. Now the average duration of uh, exposure is about 7 years and there's about a 20 year latency. So Percy said they smoked for a couple years and you know, they haven't touched in a long time, they're still definitely at risk. Uh, mixed variant histology makes up about 10 to 20 percent of cases and as you everyone here knows uh, hematuria is the most common presentation though with more advanced disease you can have flank pain though it's less common. Now there's a you know common conception or misconception that maybe bladder is the same as upper tract so if we take a look at that if you look at uh, upper tract it's a 2 to 1 male to female ratio whereas bladder is 4 to 1. Looking at the gender it doesn't really make a difference in terms of cancer specific mortality there's likely similar tumor genesis, though it's different. Um, there's unique factors for upper tract, like aristocolic acid and Blackfoot disease. Now, you know, it's thought that maybe your, your thelial carcinoma of the bladder is more common because there's a longer dwell time. But if you think of risk factors that would increase the, the dwell time, uh, none of those are risk factors for upper tract. You know, uh, ureteral seals or chronic hydronephrosis. Uh, looking at genetic syndromes, Lynch syndrome type 2, it's, you know, the classic is upper tract, it's not bladder. And uh, there's, you know, different mutations that are more common in upper tract versus bladder. It's about 10 to 20 percent uh, hereditary background for upper tract urethelial carcinoma. And this is more related to location, but it's very difficult to stage um, accurately in terms of T stage and low versus high grade. Uh, at the time of diagnosis, about 60% of upper tract is invasive, whereas only uh, 15 to 25% of bladder is invasive. Now, if we take a look at aristocolic acid, it's a, Chine it's a Chinese herb, and it's been associated with Chinese herb nephropathy. Um, There's some case reports uh, years ago of a switch in one of a kind of, um, common Chinese herbs, and this other herb caused end-stage renal disease. Now, with the end-stage renal disease, um, about 46% of these patients would develop upper tract urethelial carcinoma, so uh, it really is a risk factor. And it's a specific product of it. This d tam uh, causes a specific p53 mutation that's unique. Uh, it's not really seen outside of uh, exposure to this. And uh, there's a lot of bilateral cases, and it lacks that male predominance, showing that you know, this is an independent risk factor. And it, you don't see a lot of bladder cancer with this. It really is upper tract. If we look at Lynch syndrome, it's mostly type 2. Um, it's the one associated with colorectal cancer, but it really has the extra clonic um, manif manifestations as well. Upper tract is the thir third most common tumor type. It represents about 5 to 6 percent of the extra clonic manifestations, and the relative risk of developing it is about 5 to 6 percent, so it's much higher than the general population. Now, it's almost dominant transmission. And it's associated with DNA uh, mismatch repair, which is important for upper tract because that um, is something that resonates throughout it. It's really associated with, because you have that uh, DNA mismatch repair mutation, you get microsatellite instability. Uh, you get uh, replication errors, frame shifts, and there's high levels of this within upper tract urethelial carcinoma. And having lots of mismatch repair is actually beneficial in terms of uh, advanced T stage disease uh, for response to chemotherapy. Now there's some recent guidelines out and basically says you know CT and ureteroscopy are the the workhorse of, um, of diagnosis. Looking at urine cytology, cysto um, cystoscopy, also important um, and recommended but uh, there's some challenges and we'll talk about those. Now if we look at the diagnosis of this, um, if cytology is positive but within the bladder and the prostate uh, it's negative, that's suggestive but not definitive. It's less sensitive for upper tract urethelial carcinoma than in bladder cancer. And it's most sensitive in the renal pelvis with high um, grade disease. But if you look at the overall positive predictive value and negative predictive value, it's not great. 
you know, with high grade disease, it's predicted maybe to be 80 to 90 percent sensitive, a, uh, a wash, upper tract wash, but only 50 percent uh, specific because of um, this next concern. If you have the wash positive uh, in the context of voided um, urine positive, you're not sure exactly where it came from, and if it's something like CIS, it can be very hard to localize. You also do retrograde pilograms. It's very, it's quite sensitive and specific, uh, but it has a higher negative predictive value. You know, if you don't have that filling defect, you're pretty sure that there's probably nothing there. But ureteroscopy is the best way to look in and be sure. Um, the problem with it is uh, ureteroscopy can be challenging, especially look in all the nooks and crannies, look for that small lesion. Then classically, about 20% is non-diagnostic, and that's even after a biopsy. Now, after ureteroscopy, about 30% are upstage at the time of nephro, um, of, if they're re-biopsied, and about 45% at the time of nephro-U. So we really are not good at accurately T-staging and um, seeing if it's high grade or low grade. Now, just want to show a little video. It should work. So. Now this is just showing um, ureteroscopy with a, cla with a obviously there's um, an access sheath working and your normal biopsy. So this is like the classic uh, biopsy forcep used. You know, you have great tumor tissue here, and you can see very well, and there's lots of tumor to grab, so you get a little bite, and the problem is lots are non-diagnostic because it, it's a crushing forcep. You really have to get some tissue that's not crushed. Um, so, you know, a company came out with something called Bigopsy, and this is essentially a cold-cut biopsy of the upper tract. Sounds great. You can get a big chunk. Now, if we take a look at a video, same thing, you have your access sheet. Now, you see how far ahead it has to be for, uh, to, to visualize the system? They're essentially putting something that's fairly rigid and blunt into the system, trying to find the tumor. Now, your flow is very limited because this has a, um, a large diameter. So now, looking around for the tumor, now when you open the jaws, everything's obscured. So you're blindly putting it into the tumor to try and get a big bite. So it's also not great. Now, if we talk about um, radiologic diagnosis, CT remains the gold standard. Um, it has a pretty good positive and negative predictive value, but there are lots of um, false positives and times when it, you know, it will miss tumors, especially with smaller tumors, less than five millimeters. Um, there is some work looking at it helping to predict grade and stage. It, there's a greater uh, degree of spe uh, speculation and irregular irregularity with high-grade disease and muscle invasive disease. But it's you know different between different radiologists. There are new things coming out, looking at ways to integrate the urologist into that uh, that process. So there's one study that looked at endoluminal ultrasound. So you go up with your ureteroscope, and you have a small ultrasound probe, and then you can look at that to see if you think it's invasive. You can analyze it after as well. Get your colleagues to take a look. Um, and this was a very small series, but it had 100% positive predictive value, but not perfect negative predictive value. It was difficult with bulky tumors. Now, looking at MR, you know, with diffusion weighted imaging, we've seen that it can help. Yeah. T1. Yeah. Um, if you're interested, that's the matin at all. So, looking at uh, MR, um, diffusion weighted imaging can help predict uh, grade in many different types of cancers. We're familiar with it, obviously, for prostate cancer. But looking here, um, they did find that you could predict uh, cancer versus non-cancer with um, the apparent diffusion coefficient, and it did, did help predict grade. It was statistically significant, but there obviously is some overlap. Um, so this is a new technology coming out, optical coherence to, uh, tomography, and what it does is essentially looks at um, backscattered light, and it takes multiple single shots, puts it together for a 3D image. So it's similar to ultrasound, um, and it's also kind of like confocal microscopy, if anyone's familiar with that. So you do your ureteroscopy, you, you do this imaging while you're doing it, and then they did a biopsy. And now they only looked at the patients went for uh, nephroureterectomy or segmental ureterectomy, so had pathology in the end to look at um, how well it correlated with grade and stage. They actually did very well, you know, 87% sensitive for grade. And before we were talking about biopsy, this is really an improvement. Pretty good spent, uh, specificity at 90%, and stage 100%. So, I mean, it can really tell you if it's muscle invasive. And, uh, and in the end, a little later, you'll see how important that is to have accurate T and T stage and also grade. So, if we look at nephron sparing surgery, this is, I think, the preferred approach for low risk disease. Um, and 
you have to be able to ablate all the tumor right now. You know, you can't, um, there's, there isn't chemo yet that's uh, good enough to treat. Um, and it's been shown not to compromise oncologic outcomes, equal overall and cancer-specific survival. But if you look at the 10-year recurrence rate, 21% are free from tumor. You know, recurrence is the name of the game, and you have to surveil these people closely and be ready to do a uh, nephrony redirectomy if you really want to cure them, possibly. But if you look at um, the stages, this was you know, not low versus high grade. It was in the time of G1, 2, and 3. G1 tumors did very well, and 96% uh, of people did not require nephro-U, uh, though 20% of patients with high grade ended up keeping their kidney. Now, if we look at different treatments in the nephron's uh, sparing approach, but not um, open surgery or lap surgery, um, we can ablate the tumors either using coagulation or laser. And there's many different lasers we can use, and we'll talk about them. Or we can do percutaneous approaches. There's obviously laser, and there's also uh, cautery. This is a busy slide. It's basically just to say that the main lasers are holmium, neodymium, and uh, thulium. Now, if we look at holmium, everyone knows holmium. You know, it's the workhorse of urology. It works by uh, creating a steam bubble, and it's pulse, so it uh, separates the tissue layers by tearing them. And its depth of penetration is about 400 microns, so keep that in mind for the next ones. Now, the normal renal pelvis urethelium is about 1,000, so, you know, you're not getting too deep, and you can work on the same amount of tissue, hopefully without perforating. That's why one reason it's been so good. Now, if we look at neodymium, um, it has a coagulative effect. Um, now, it's, it's deep. It's full transmural ablation. Um, it, the, the tissue becomes uh, fluffy, whitish, and sloughs off over several days. Multiple studies have looked at using this to abl um, ablate the bulk of the tumor and then use homium after to do your finer precision work. Um, though there is uh, possibly increased risk of uh, ureteric strictures when used in the ureter, and that's just from the depth of penetration or predicted from that. The depth is 600 to 1800, um, so it's quite a bit deeper than homium. Uh, and this was first used in terms of uh, prostate and bladder, and they actually found bowel injury does occur, so it is very deep, so you have to be careful. <laughs> Now, if we look at thulium, you know, it's kind of the new laser um, out there. Uh, initially, it was for bladder and urethelial carcinoma within the, uh, sorry, for prostate and urethelial carcinoma. Main effect is also through water. Now, this is pulsed or continuous, so it's a very versatile laser, and it also does the coagulative effect, so it, you know, has great hemostasis. You know, when we're looking at those videos, we hadn't seen a lot of biopsies yet. You know, these tumors can bleed and obscure your vision. The depth is about 250 to 400, so it's kind of in the holmium air um, range. One study, what they did was they uh, got urologists, they just intermittently throughout years, about five years, got them to use uh, holmium or got them to use thulium. And just um, after each uh, interaction, got them to grade the, um, the laser. And they found that it had better performance, better tip stability, precision, reduced bleeding, probably from that coagulative effect, and less mucosal perforation. There's some, there was some concerns about temperature in the literature. Um, but there's multiple in vitro and in vivo studies, and it wasn't physiologically important or harmful. Now, if we look at percutaneous treatment, um, I think this is really for your low-grade urethelial carcinoma that can't be effectively treated with, um, with the laser uh, in a retrograde sense with your ureteroscopy. This is, you know, it's either location, bulkiness, or just the renal anatomy is unfavorable. Um, could also be an option for your solitary kidney, where the alternative would be a nephrourectomy in a patient who doesn't want dialysis. Now, if you're using cautery with monopolar cautery, you're getting about 300 versus 160 with bipolar. So bipolar is about the, um, it, it's a little more controlled. One study by Cutris et al., uh, this was over 20 years. They looked at their experience. It, it wasn't just based on percutaneous, but they did retrospectively look at it. And they found that there was a 17% transfusion risk. So, you know, it's much higher than just doing a, um, a PCNL. 2% had AKI requiring dialysis. So some of these people are still at risk for going um, into end-stage renal disease, and 1% required an emergency nephro-U or embolization, so, you know, the procedure kind of getting out of control. There is that risk of seeding. Um, it's mostly case reports. In the largest study I could find, it was about 0.3%, so it's very low. It's not really stratified in terms of what's uh, most at risk, but it looks like high-grade disease, which you could probably predict. So I just want to show a little video. Um, you know, as I said, this is a uh, kind of a bit more desperate, you know, you're really trying to save them from a nephrourethectomy, and um, costs are higher. So this is monopolar cautery, rollerball used to ablate, you know, a very large tumor. 
um, that would have otherwise required a nephrouridectomy. And the risk is you might have to get a nephrouridectomy if something goes wrong here. So patients, you know, need to be aware of that possibility. What about the risk of seeding? So um, it's mostly just from um, case reports, but from larger studies that have been done over many years like this one, it's about 0.3%, and they think it's mostly with high grade. So if you're doing this where you really do think it's low grade, um, the risk is quite low, but it is possible. But, it, you know, it's a, a rare disease and it's a rare complication, so it's tough to really... Um, when you look back in the history of partial cystectomies, uh, yeah. yeah, I, I think this is really for the low-grade disease. I think in the high-grade disease, you're really asking for trouble if you're doing uh, a lot of the nephron-sparing surgery. Um, it's more for the palliative patient who you're just trying to keep the, the tumor at bay or someone who's unwilling to go dialysis and you're, you're trying your best, but um, there, are, there are real complications. Yeah. Uh, one of the problems is that a lot of the patients that we're getting are obviously older than their age and they come in and they don't have travel over 200 and they said there's no way I'm going on dialysis. And then as soon as you perk that kidney, there's going to be a very high risk of temporary tumor dialysis, yeah. which often goes on to permanent tumor dialysis. So, so then you have a discussion with the patient about if it's, if it's if you have a prior biopsy for a low grade disease, you have a discussion about whether or not you do not have it. So I have some slides, I have some slides coming up looking at upper tract chemo. I have some slides coming up looking at upper tract chemo for uh, low and even high. Um, it you know it dwells in the system. We'll talk about it, but it's possible to even treat it without having that primary laser or monopolar ablation. Um, it's not here yet, but I'll, I'll talk about it in a second. But that's a great point, point. and that's that. Um, that's what they've seen is two percent requiring dialysis. So there are people who don't tolerate it and end up going somewhere where maybe they don't want to. I think that's low. Think that's low? Okay. Yeah, I, I'm aware of some of them. I, I do appreciate what you're saying and publish on it because there's there's just so little out there that um, it's all retrospective and small. Um, so it's so it maybe pushes for another treatment. I, I totally understand that, but uh, it's a very good point, Dr. Gleave, and I'm just inviting the room to correct me with something in the literature because I only have to go with the literature. Before you move on from yeah. partial, you said that 20% of the grade threes Kept their kidney. Kept their kidney. Yeah. What happened to the other 80%? Did they go on Multiple ureteroscopies. But how many of them died? How many of them had So from what I could find, it was, danger it was equal overall survival and cancer-specific survival in those individuals. So we're in, a, you know, in the era of surveillance. Yeah. I mean, you need a lot of surveillance. We'll talk about that. I mean, you're every three months at the beginning doing ureteroscopy, CT, urine cytology. You really are watching these people closely. So, uh, it, I mean, it's, it's not for everyone. Some people, it's just best to cut it out. And th we'll talk here just about um, other things that can maybe decrease the risk of recurrence. So this is a familiar name, I think, for everyone, Mike Metcalf. Um, when he was at MD Anderson, he published this. And it's looking at induction and maintenance, uh, mitomycin C, for upper tract urethelial carcinoma. And they looked retrospectively at any patient who was offered this. And there wasn't great in terms of, you know, logical reasoning, this is why, other than you know, these people will be at high risk for recurrence. So this is TA, T1 degrees, um, T1 um, depth of invasion without CIS. And what they did is they either used a nephrostomy or they used a uh, ureteric catheter. And the nephrostomy was placed and then allowed uh, two weeks for maturation before it was used. And the ureteric catheter is replaced in office under fluoro. Um, and they would start the treatment and then the nurse would continue the treatment going. So they do a, you know, they do a Leone stent. He just left, so that's gone. Um, so they just secure the ureteric catheter to a Foley catheter. And then they use um, um, manometry to keep the pressure at uh, 20 or below 30. And that way you wouldn't get um, pylovenous backflow. And they, they, this is the era, I think, where they were still rolling patients. I don't think that's really what's happening now. And they also gave some prophylactic antibiotics. And what they did is they did induction once weekly for six weeks. 
and then patients went on to maintenance, and they either had a monthly treatment every, uh, sorry, a monthly treatment for three months, or they had weekly treatments for three weeks, and they didn't do dehydration or alkalinization, so it wasn't perfect. I mean, there still is ways to improve. They had obviously different treatment groups. Uh, you know, I said that they didn't rationalize well who they brought into this study, but they had elective patients. And these are the patients that they're really trying to cure, the healthy patients, the imperative patients. These are the Dr. Patterson patients, you know, bilateral, solitary kidney, chronic disease, low GFR, or palliative. These are the people you're just trying to um, have some local control with. And looking at this, they, they did have some high grade in the study. About 25% was high grade. They did have multifocal, most was uh, solitary, and um, it's about split, normal, normal renal function versus not. Um, in terms of nephrostomy tube, it was mostly by ureteric catheter. It was left up to the patient with whatever they wanted, and there was some patients with Lynch, Lynch syndrome. So a lot of these people are at risk for um, bilateral occurrence, you know, reasons to want to give them this. Um, Lynch syndrome was based on tissue, genetic uh, testing, or Amsterdam criteria. Follow-up was every three months, and then for one year, and then six months. And this is if they're not having recurrences. And they're doing, you know, what you need to do. So obviously they're doing your ureteroscopy, your cytology, chems, they're doing their CT scan. 60% had one course of maintenance. And at three years, they found progression-free survival, 80% in low grade. So, you know, not that many are going on. Um, and I think we've also had improvements in staging. So, we're, you know, we're better at telling what it is. And 60%, 67% of high grade uh, did not have recurrence. Now, um, I mean, the, they also looked at a lot of other things. Looking at nephrectomy, 76% um, overall uh, w did not require a nephrectomy, and 82 for low grade. So, you know, these people are doing very well, uh, even in the shorter term. And looking at cancer-specific mortality, no one died. Uh, it's well tolerated, 14% uh, versus um, events. You, the usual stuff for mitomycin. So, you know, urinary tract infections, bladder spasms. Um, they did see some ureteric strictures, but these people are having multiple ureteroscopies, multiple laser ablations, and obviously multiple um, catheters placed. So it's unclear what exactly caused it, but uh, it is there. Uh, so this is something that's kind of coming down the pipeline. So this is uh, sustained release formulation of mitomycin C. It's called mitogel. It's an aqueous mixture that when at room, at body temperature, it becomes much more viscous. So instead of staying in the system for minutes, it'll stay in for hours. And um, this initially was through antigrade insulation. They looked at blood sampling to see if there was systemic absorption. And um, they also um, did interval and survival nephrectomy to look at toxic changes. And they found the majority had no abnormalities, um, no hydronephrosis, and there was just some signs of chronic irritation. They also did this in a retrograde fashion. Um, they tried to maximize the amount of mitomycin that was safe for... Uh, th this is done in pigs, sorry, I should have said that. Um, this is, this is preclinical here. Um, so they want to maximize the concentration. And they observed the same thing um, when they did it retrograde. It's tolerated very well. They did find some signs of uh, irritation and no hydronephrosis. So this is a study ongoing right now. Um, it's prospective single arm phase three. And it's trying to look at the efficacy and safety uh, and tolerability of this as for primary treatment. So these aren't people that are being ablated. This is the pa uh, patient Dr. Patterson was talking about that, um, you know, let's say it's, well, and they're including the low grade, not too big, um, but, you know, they're excluding anyone who's been ablated. This isn't your adjuvant treatment. This is your primary treatment. So maybe this is, you know, that, um, that treatment hopefully in the future for people who can't tolerate systemic chemo or uh, nephrodurectomy or to go into dialysis. So, uh, you know, I keep talking about the close follow-up. Um, this is the European guidelines, and they're saying, you know, you need to be doing urine cytology, CT scan, um, you're doing cystoscopy, reteroscopy, and uh, upper tract washes. You, I mean, you really have to be sure that there's nothing there, especially if this is a, an elective patient where you're um, trying to, like they have a healthy contralateral kidney. Looking at the Canadian guidelines, very similar. You know, we're doing a, a little bit less CT. We're not doing the three-month CT, or not supposed to be. Um, and we're doing more chest x-rays just to make sure that they're not progressing um, systemically. Now, in terms of looking at the gold standard, uh, you know, radical nephro U, uh, plus or minus template lymph node dissection, and removal of the distal ureter with the bladder cuff is the gold standard. Um, people should be, uh, you know, advised that. And this can be done open or laparoscopic, and there are benefits, and we'll talk about the, especially the lymph node dissections 
you know, unless you're doing a ret retroperitoneal lymph node dissection laparoscopically, uh, it probably should be done open sometimes. Um, or segmental uh, uh, ureterectomy. So looking at lymph node dissections and uh, lymphonectomy, um, it, in node positive disease, uh, it's a negative predictive indicator. I think we all could probably pick that if you had lymph node positive disease, you're not going to do very well. And so five-year cancer-specific survival for positive disease is between 0 and 39%, so it's pretty bleak. And subgroup analysis revealed um, there is benefit for lymph node dissections in patients who are um, muscle invasive and beyond. And there is some small studies showing that there's cancer-specific survival is higher in patients with a template lymph node dissection versus uh, no lymph node dissection or an incomplete uh, dissection. And sometimes this can actually help um, aid in overall survival or some uh, durable disease control in patients who are node positive. So this is a study out of Japan and they, um, they wanted to prospectively, non-randomized look at template lymph node dissections. So everyone uh, was offered template lymph node dissection as long as they were less than 75 and without comorbidities. And so they looked at essentially the patients who didn't want to undergo the dissection and the possible morbidity of the dissection. So in the, uh, in the renal pelvis, they actually found that uh, the patients did very well. Um, they looked at uh, the left kidney, it's left hilar periaortic, so the normal kind of areas where we're familiar with. And the right side, it's the right hilar, it's paracaval, retrocaval, and intraaortal cable. Uh, complications grade 3 and up were about 5% for renal tumors and 2.5% for um, ureteric tumors. Now looking at the overall survival, cancer specific survival, they actually found that there was uh, a statistically significant difference. In terms of the three year overall survival, they found 86% uh, in the template lymph node dissection versus 48. Now obviously, you know, we said that some patients weren't eligible for this because they're too sick, and it, but mostly it was uh, patient preference. So this is not a randomized prospective trial. Um, looking at multivariate analysis, lymph node dissection was uh, significant, especially for survival in the muscle invasive group. There was no in, uh, improved survival for the template ureteric tumors. And that's, um, there was, this study went on by Matten and really looked at the renal pelvis and they essentially found the same thing that um, they thought the lymph node spread to the same area, so they agreed with Kondo et al. But looking back at the ureteric tumors, they kind of found some insight. So this was um, retrospective in a prospectively maintained database. And um, they also looked at radical nephroureterectomy, segmental ureterectomy. And what they had was uh, one surgeon at three different sites, um, so three surgeons total, uh, doing a template lymph node dissection and looking at node positive uh, non-metastatic disease. And they uh, actually found that patients who had the uh, this template, which we'll talk about, had uh, uh, improved outcomes. So looking at the renal pelvis and the proximal ureter, um, what they found was there was more upward migration from the mid-distal ureter to the paracaval and paraortic para -aortic region, and that's different from condo. They didn't uh, appreciate that before. Um, so it's probably a secondary landing site, they thought. You know, if you're positive in the closer nodes, maybe you should do a farther dissection. Uh, and, and the interaortal cable nodes, it was actually more common right uh, instead of left side. Looking at mid ureteric tumors, they found that on the left side there was more retrograde flow, so you need to go down to internal iliacs if you're really trying to do an aggressive node dissection for a patient, and they found that there was more right to left crossover. And finally, looking at the distal ureter, they found that there was quite a bit of upward migration, more than Condo et al. found previously. So, you know, we're really trying to figure out who we need to do the lymph nodes on, um, or in the future, who we're going to be looking at chemotherapy on. So this is a study, and it was looking at a preoperative multivariable prognostic model, trying to predict who, you know, who's going to do poorly and who really needs this uh, extra treatment to try not to overtreat people. They looked at age, gender, race, symptoms, ECOG uh, performance score, um, tumor side, primary tumor location, and tumor architecture, and plus your, your classic ones. And they did a backward stepwise uh, uh, step-down regression to, to look at this. So this is the nomogram that they came up with. It's point score for ureteric location, or um, tumor location, and you'll see people don't agree, um, you know, it should be the ureter or the renal pelvis is high risk, but they thought it was the renal pelvis. And they put a lot of emphasis on tumor grade, which we all know is important, and uh, also on the architecture. So if it's sessile, you know, that's uh, 
increased risk factor for invasiveness. And they found it was 76.6% uh, accurate in terms of predicting non-organ confined disease. There are multiple other models, and when someone looked at all these models, they found that this was the most predictive model. Someone actually looked at it in different population, because as I said, you know, some people think that renal tumors are worse, and some people think that ureteric tumors are worse. And they found actually a difference between the, the American and a Chinese cohort. And in the American group, hydronephrosis had worse outcome, prior cystectomy, uh, and sessile, which we talked about. Everyone does bad if you have high grade, low GFR, uh, T3 disease, or a low neutrophil lymphocyte ratio, and that's in the blood. And the Chinese cohort, they actually found that the ureteric tumor, uh, tumor size and being male, was worse for outcome. Now in terms of renal function, post-radical uh, nephroeugorectomy, um, 18 to 24 uh, percent percent had decrease in their GFR. So some people, kidney didn't really matter, their other kidney can make up for it. Um, it's, they're higher risk for having deterioration if they're greater than 7 years old. But if you look at this, in terms of patients who had a threshold GFR of 60, only 37% were eligible for neoadjuvant chemotherapy um, after the nephro-U, and uh, only 16%, or sorry, uh, before the nephro-U, and only 16% were eligible after. So this, you know, not a lot of patients are eligible before or after. And if we look at a threshold of 45, um, a GFR of 45, 72% were eligible for neoadjuvant, and only 52% were eligible for adjuvant. You know, and this is important because if we're trying to figure out, you know, which people would really benefit from chemo, we need to figure out who is at high risk for having recurrence so we, you know, try and um, not over-treat as many people as possible. And, um, and also, you know, who won't be eligible for, um, for adjuvant therapy. So this is kind of a, you know, a dinky slide in terms of, you know, a meta-analysis of two papers. This is obviously for neoadjuvant and adjuvant, but this is just looking at the neoadjuvant. And I wanted to focus on the newer study by Porton et al., and what they did is, there was ne uh, nephroeugorectomies done from 1993 to 2003. And they realized that their uh, outcomes hadn't really changed. And so what they wanted to do is, they started offering all of their patients from 2004 on, neoadjuvant chemotherapy, for patients that they, that they thought were high risk. High risk, they thought, was high-grade disease, sessile, and large tumors. So they're using their own nomogram to figure it out. Um, and one thing they also saw was increased lymph node dissection. I think that's just changing as people are... Um, figuring out the, uh, the lymph node spread. And age, sessile, and neoadjuvant chemotherapy on univariate analysis were important for overall survival or disease-specific survival. Uh, all T stages are important. And um, now this database didn't have the, the chemotherapy listed. So in terms of which one did best, they're using MVAC, Dostens MVAC, GEM-CIS, some ephosphamide, co different combinations. Uh, the median was four cycles. Now, they found a lot of downstaging. So previously, Matt and et al. found 25% reduction in T2 with chemotherapy and 40% or 41% reduction in T3 or greater. So you're getting a lot of uh, downstaging and also 14% complete response. So when you look at the other side, you're saying, well, the neoadjuvant group had you know, T0 and you know, a lot of TA. That's actually the people who were downstaged. They also found less uh, invasive disease, less um, muscle invasive disease, and less organ confined disease. Um, now looking at um, disease specific survival, it's statistically significant that patients who undergo neoadjuvant chemotherapy do better. And so these are two different cohorts over different years. Uh, now looking after the nephroeurectomy at intravesicular recurrence, it's very common, you know, 27 to 50 percent depending on which papers you look at. Um, there are kind of a breakdown of risk factors. There's patient-specific risk factors. So male, uh, independent of smoking, was found to be a risk factor. Previous bladder tumors. There's tumor-specific factors, so multifocal, large. Preoperative urine cytology makes sense, you know, if you're picking up the tumors in the, the, uh, through the, the bladder. Ureteric tumor location and preoperative hydronephrosis. Uh, and then there's also treatment-specific factors. Tumor manipulation during nephroeugorectomy. There was some talk, you know, open versus lap, but no one agrees, and there's so many variables. And uh, preoperative ureteroscopy. This was if you touched the tumor or not. If you just went in and looked and saw the tumor and you didn't manipulate it, uh, this was still a risk factor for uh, recurrence. And also extra uh, vesicle excision of the distal ureter. That's why excision of the distal cuff is so important. Now, this is a study. Um, it was by the SUO looking at uh, 744 people were polled. And looking to see what they do in terms of um, after the nephro U, you know, who gets intravesicular chemo. 158 people responded, so not a great response. 
but it found that approximately 50% of people give intravesicular chemo regularly, and only 15% uh, of those people had a history of bladder cancer. So this is independent of bladder cancer. People are still giving it. 88% of people gave mitomycin C. Uh, now, one-third of people gave it intraoperatively, and they give it before um, the, they put it in, and then when they're about to manage the bladder cuff, they drain the bladder, and then would, uh, would open the bladder and excise the cuff. 7% um, of people did it less than post-op day three. So before you've got a cystogram, probably they, they might be still in hospital or might be out. And 37% did it, you know, probably when the catheter's coming out, day four to seven. 20% did it uh, quite a bit later. And only one-third of people routinely used a uh, cystogram. Now, uh, in another study, they found that mitomycin intraoperatively um, before the bladder cuff management and after, with drainage of the catheter was safe. They actually found no local or systemic uh, side effects. So this is just another study looking at, um, it, it, I guess a better form study, uh, looking at RCT multi-center. Um, this is in Europe. And they had 284 patients who had a, a nephro-U, uh, no history of bladder cancer. So really just looking at upper tract. And 105 patients received mitomycin C, 115 observation. Um, spanned a number of years. And they had one post-op single dose, not concentrated, um, prior to catheter removal. Uh, they didn't say when that was, but it's you know, about 7 to 14 days, so quite a bit after. And we know from bladder cancer that you want to put it in less than 24 hours. And they looked at recurrence. They did uh, cystoscopy and cytology. Uh, oh, sorry, they did cystoscopy. They didn't require cytology. Um, there was more high grade in the mit mitomycin arm, so confounding variable. And they found recurrence is more... Um, common with moderately to poorly differentiated tumors. So this is Kaplan-Meier in terms of uh, intravesicular recurrence. They found 40% relative risk reduction and 11% absolute risk, risk reduction with intravesicular treatment. This wasn't statistically significant though, uh, and it's speculated that that's based on there was no standard time of catheter removal, so some people had it 7 days, some had it 14, and as we know from bladder cancer, it's best to do within less than 24 hours. Now this is another study out of Japan. Um, RCT multi-centered, 77 patients who underwent uh, radical nephro U uh, through multiple years, as you know, this is a rare disease. And they either had one dose of pirorubicin, which is uh, an analog of doxorubicin, and they had it within 48 hours. So a little closer, and at least it's a standardized time. And they also looked at uh, cytology and uh, cystoscopy. They actually found at one, at one and two year recurrence rate of 16.9%, for the patients who were treated, versus 31% and 42% in the non-treated groups at one and two years, respectively. Um, it was statistically significant. There wasn't any immediate bladder symptoms or hematologic complications of this early administration before um, getting a cystogram. Now, looking post-op, trying to figure out you know, who's going to do poorly post-operatively and maybe need adjuvant therapy or you know, another treatment, we keep talking about this tumor stage. Uh, extra nodal extension, I mean, that's just poor. Tumor grade, LVI, surgical margins, you know, nothing here is really new. Uh, we've talked about this before, but obviously bringing in ASA and obesity, other, other uh, poor prognostic factors. And so um, this is by Sison, um, looking at how can we pull these together? There's so many risk factors. What can we actually use to figure out how people are gonna do? Retrospective, uh, multi-institution and tertiary care. Looks at over 2,000 patients, T1 to T3, um, and they found 60% of T2 and 3 um, were uh, either node 0 or unknown. Um, and this is a chemotherapy naive. They didn't get any neoadjuvant chemotherapy. They found that with their nomogram, they, they could predict the accuracy of, um, of recurrence or of um, disease progression, uh, 0 0.81. And on multivariable analysis, uh, this was statistically significant. They found that age, um, T2, 3, uh, ureteric location, multifocal LVI, tumor archetype, uh, being sessile or concomitant CIS, though they found T stage was the most important. So this is their nomogram, just what we talked about. Um, so they're pulling all these things, giving a point score, and then trying to figure out who's going to do poorly after. And this is really trying to figure out, you know, if we didn't give neoadjuvant chemotherapy, uh, who maybe should we give adjuvant to? So this is a study looking at adjuvant chemotherapy um, in what they define as a high-risk population. We'll talk about what they define as high-risk. 14 centers, over 800 patients, 129 received uh, adjuvant chemotherapy. And what they did is they looked at uh, their patients that they thought were high risk and they offered them adjuvant. 
and they either got MVAC, GEMSYS, or uh, other if they had renal insufficiency. And most people received only two cycles of MVAC or approximately two of GEMSYS. So they looked at um, the tumor, well, tumor grade came out as an important prognostic factor, T stage, LVI, lymph node involvement. Uh, and when they looked after, they found adjuvant chemotherapy was important for, um, for outcome. So they uh, developed a risk point score, and with the point score, they stratified into low, intermediate, and, and high risk, and they only offered uh, adjuvant chemotherapy the high risk, really trying to minimize who they're over-treating. And they did find it was uh, statistically significant in terms of um, who, this prognostic uh, nomogram. Looking at actually after we've given the adjuvant chemotherapy, if you lump all the chemo together, they found that there wasn't a difference. But if you break it down into the MVAC versus GEMSYS versus nothing, they found that the GEMSYS didn't do as well. They didn't explain why. Maybe it's the site or who they're offering it. Maybe the people who wouldn't survive MVAC. Uh, but they found MVAC had a statistically significant um, cancer-specific survival rate. So this was looked at recently. Um, Sison et al. keep saying that name. He's doing large uh, retrospective database work. This is over 3,000 patients in the U.S. in the na National Cancer Database. Had over 700 patients, pathologic T3 or 4, with node positive. And so these are all people who got adjuvant therapy, um, and 250 were in the observation armor, you know, people who weren't offered it or given it. And uh, it was unclear which chemo was given. So in this study, you do have MVAC mix, mixed with GEMSYS, um, and the time, median time to chemotherapy was 47 days, and um, multivariate analysis indicated that younger age, ureteric lo location, uh, any positive uh, nodes, or surgical margin positive increase of um, the, the, well, the risk of getting adjuvant. I mean, I guess it's a risk, but maybe it's a benefit. Uh, and they did this um, propensity-weighted score, so it's called inverse probability of treatment weighting, just a way to um, uh, equal the groups, trying to figure out uh, if they're the same. And they found that uh, the difference was less than 10%, so statistically this would be that the treatment arms are equivalent in terms of um, uh, their makeup. They found that the rate of adjuvant chemotherapy was equal, so it's not like we're giving a lot more of it. And with this, in terms of the Kaplan-Meier curve, um, they're finding that the patients who received adjuvant chemotherapy are actually doing better. Uh, their overall survival with adjuvant chemotherapy was 47 months versus 35 months without. Um, and this translated to a 12-month overall survival benefit, so a full year for people who got the adjuvant therapy. Um, now, the treat. Way that analysis tries to correct for this. There's a lot of people who just can't get chemo because their protoplasm is so bad. Yeah. They're all going to be yellow. Yep, so they're already going to be worse. You know, this is one of the inherent problems of um, small population, um, of, you know, like in terms of the disease, there's not many patients. It's tough to get RCTs going or accrue people. So this is definitely not perfect. And when we talk about, um, um, well, in terms of neoadjuvant, people, it, there's a bit more uh, evidence. So, um, so they found only 20% of the people T3 or T4 received adjuvant chemotherapy. And one thing they found is people who had uh, no nodes sampled actually had less chemo, uh, which is you know kind of interesting. They actually had it less than people who had N0. And they think that those are probably people who they thought were too sick for their, um, their lymph node dissection. So probably that same person wouldn't be eligible for chemotherapy. And uh, in this study they found that you know the usual risk factors in terms of poor prognosis um, didn't matter for chemo. All those risk factors for someone doing poorly, those people did better with the chemotherapy. Uh, this is just another study of in this year looking at exactly the same thing but using the same IPTW um, propensity score analysis. They couldn't, um, they couldn't account for all the variables. They even tried multiple other um, statistical methods and in the end it sounds like they agreed that uh, their numbers weren't robust enough. So in terms of summary, um, accurate staging is becoming ever more important with your upper tract urethelial carcinoma. Um, we're getting you know, new staging techniques and uh, nephron sparing techniques and that's helping with the management and the diagnosis. Uh, I think the prognostic modalities should be helping at least you know, as we're getting more evidence for neoadjuvant chemotherapy, chemotherapy or trying to decide, you know, who needs uh, a nephrouterectomy and you know shouldn't be offered a um, nephron sparing technique. Uh, intraoperative 
uh, intravesicular therapy really makes the most sense from what we know about bladder cancer, and there are studies that are showing it's, it's safe. Uh, Dr. Black's not here, but I know he's really interested in that, so I think we might start seeing some stuff coming from him about doing it right at the time of surgery. And there's more evidence coming for um, upper tract delivery of mitomycin C um, in the patient who's never been ablated or in the patient who's uh, post-ablation. And so I just want to end with some questions. You know, looking at Lynch syndrome, should we be screening these people for upper tract? Uh, you know, they're at risk and um, they're probably already getting, you know, CT scans for screening of other things. Um, you know, what's the best diagnostic test that we should be doing? We're getting these new things. Should we be doing confocal microscopy? Um, I haven't seen any of it, so I'm not sure how far down the pipeline it is. And um, looking at the most effective nephron sparing techniques, you know, it's not just homium. There's lots of other, lots of other things we can use and there's lots of chemotherapeutic agents that can be used. Um, so, uh, anyways, I'll end it there.